Well, thank you for having me. I think the last time I gave a UFOP, uh, Valkyrie was a fetus. So uh, <laughs> that tells me it's been about time. So I'm really glad to be back. <laughs> um, and a lot has happened since then. I think it's been a pretty phenomenal time. So, OK, I'll just start talking. And if you can't hear me, you will soon. That's OK. Um, hi, I'm here to talk about ammonites, which I love so dearly, but I'm also here to talk about different tools that paleontologists are now using to make our wildest dreams come true. And a lot I think about living in modern times is just recognizing that we're living in the future that we were waiting for and we have to stop waiting and get up and actually do something with it, which I find challenging, honestly. Um, whether it's all of our communication strategies, meetings like this one, or the tools that we finally have at our disposal as everyday paleontologists. So the theme I decided to title this is Ammonite Renaissance Technology and Imagination Changing Our View of Ancient Seas. Because it's not just what science questions we can ask. My PhD advisor would always tell me, well, the rocks are only going to tell you what the rocks are going to tell you. But we have to figure out which questions to ask and how. And that takes a lot more imagination than we sometimes admit. Um, and so I have here to kind of introduce this, a photo I took at uh, the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. It has these gorgeous, lovingly rendered, beautifully crafted, handmade models of reconstructions of animal life. And they have their cephalopods, including ammonites, which are related to octopus and squid, but they have a hard seashell. And they are, as you can see, creeping and crawling and snarfing around in the seafloor. Whereas a reconstruction we might put together today would have these animals well up in the water column, experiencing life in the open ocean or the coasts or something like that. So having this imagination that these animals are not tied to the bottom, that they are freely navigating open water, then we want to ask, well, how were they navigating open water? Were they swimming fast or slow? Were they chasing each other? Was it this dynamic, incredible ecosystem of all these different tiers and layers where there are chases every day? Was it basically something you would want to make a movie about? Is it a Pixar, you know, Finding Nemo's, uh, you know, ancestors? Or is it just glub, glub, glub on a Tuesday, right? So. Um, one of the ways that we work on these things, that we've always worked on these things, is we take these squid-like animals, they make seashells, those make fossils, we dig them up, we put them in museums, end of story, right? Um, and a lot of the reasons that ammonite fossils have been so valuable across the field of paleontology, whether you adore them as I do or not, is because they are valuable as index fossils. So if you have animals that are wildly abundant, have easily distinguished morphological features and go dead as a doornail extinct every couple of million years, then you've got this really great system of index fossils distributing themselves on every continent that you can look at the layers and say, hey, what do you got over there? Ooh, also Jurassic, nice, I like it. Those are index fossils. Uh, and so they've been valuable for paleontology this whole time. But one of the things that we have started to appreciate about them over recent, you know, the last hundred years, is really all the paleobiology we can do with them. And we can do this paleobiology in part because this incredible global record of fossils brings us wildly different shapes. If you just think about, OK, very streamlined, definitely not streamlined, sort of coiled up snake with some ribs on it. Um, whatever the hell that's doing. All right, now we're just getting into sousaphone territory and, you know, beautiful glob of knotted up rope. Sure, the shapes are doing many different things, as well as their sizes, right? So this is uh, Parapsiscosia, is this enormous, this is the cast in Los Angeles of a specimen from Germany. Uh, I think that was in London. And then this was um, <laughs> this is David just hol holding a, a little ammonite on his finger. So they have this incredible from, you know, barely the size of a pea to the size of a fiat, right? And also we can look at how these shapes and sizes are distributed across time and space. We can look at the biogeography of these animals and where we can find them through time. And we can even look at the diversity, right? If they have many different shapes and we can distinguish them and they're constantly going extinct, then we can play with their diversity. And one of the ways we do that is in the paleobiology database, which is a global collaboration of taking published specimens and putting them in an online tally that you can then play with. So here is a tally I threw together of, um, what is this? This is, uh, I want to say this is fish, mollusks, and lophophorates through time. And what I'm showing here is the red, and this is genus level taxonomy. What is the genus? Who knows? 
the red are taxa that die the same stage. They are, they are dying in this stage. And the blue are taxa that are new in this stage. The gray are carryovers. And the purple are taxa that appeared and then died in the same stage, right? And we can divvy up the last half billion years of time and play this game. And we can play this game from before dinosaur times, dinosaur times, and now, right? And we can also, yes, it's fish, mollusks, and lophophorates. We can also say, well, what about ammonites? And their boom and bust cycles of biodiversity are very dramatic. This is another thing that makes them really good index fossils. We have plenty of them and then not so many, and then plenty of them and then not so many. But something also about them that people who work on ammonites know is that because the longevity of any individual identifiable and distinguished taxonomic group of ammonites is so brief, in any given geologic stage of just a certain chunk of, say, the Triassic, most of your taxa appeared and disappeared within that stage. Right? And so this colors the way that we have opportunities to study as those booms and busts are happening in, in real time geologically, more so than any other animals that we can easily pick up macrofossils. You say, hey, cool, look, an ammonite, neat. They are doing this ridiculous boom and bust cycle. And that allows us to zero in on particular time intervals of interest. And we can think about how different kinds of ammonites appeared and disappeared through time. Now, sadly, today, <sighs> along with the birds, survivors of the end Cretaceous mass extinction included the chambered nautilus, which you can find as a few different species today, living mostly around the Philippines. And they're not a whole lot like what these extinct ammonites would be like. They're alive, which is nice. But we have a lot of anatomical differences that concern us. The ammonites proper and the ammonoids before them all went <coughs> totally extinct along with the non-avian dinosaurs. So we're a little bit out of luck in terming, determining what all these wonderful shapes and sizes and little morphological features tell us because we don't have live ones we can play with. right? Now, I am particularly fond of the aftermath of a global mass extinction that isn't the most famous or always gets the most attention, but around here we know it well. The end of the Triassic period when dinosaurs shared the Earth was followed by the wonderful Jurassic period when dinosaurs ruled the Earth. And on land, ammonites had a bit of a hard go during the Triassic mass extinction, you might say. They almost got obliterated from the entire planet. I mean, that happens now and then, especially to ammonites. But in the early Jurassic, boy howdy did they come roaring back. A lot of them stuck around, and they had this fabulous diversity and also pretty sizable specimens in wild abundance, seemingly geologically overnight. They go from kaput to ubiquitous in the blink of a geologic eye. So that has always been an interest of mine. Um, I had the great fortune during my doctoral years to work a lot in Nevada and Peru on the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, looking at the actual rocks you can trape across and say, OK, well, somewhere around here, ah, here we are in the Jurassic, and wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, ammonites, right? And so we can put together then the different um, biogeochemical cycling signals that the biogeochemists, and I leave it to them, uh, find for us by testing this um, all of the mercury and oxygen and sulfur and isotopes and things they can find in the rocks. And then they can put together a reconstruction of when Triassic time was waning, when Jurassic time was beginning in terms of the global events that were happening. Basically, short story, mass extinction, Pangaea starts splitting apart. You get a whole mess of uh, volatiles in the atmosphere. It's, it, everything's in shambles. You open an Atlantic Ocean, you destroy Pangaea global mass extinction, right? But I am interested in the aftermath of this global mass extinction. The Central Atlantic, Central Atlantic Magmatic Province is that big gash in the middle of Pangaea that just spills basalt everywhere, and with it, volatiles in the atmosphere. So we got a lot of global change, blah, 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 global change. I'm interested in the ammonites. And this work put together, reconstructing, OK, we've got these different family trees of these different ammonites that are wildly abundant. If I color code them by their morphology, the blue ones are streamlined a bit. The green ones are not. All right? So there's some pictures. Why does everyone look like a coiled up snake? Why does everybody have little ribs on them? Right? Why? I just showed you that ammonites come in all these wild sizes and shapes and spectacular things. And these things are little to dinner plate, sometimes spare tire sized. And they are almost all the different taxa. There's so many different taxa that make it the same shape. 
So a question burning in my mind, since I was a wee lass <laughs> running around in Nevada, was, yeah, but why, though? What is that good for? So this brings us to how do we guess the ecology of extinct animals? All right. And I was trained in sedimentology and fossils and thin sections. And ooh, look at the little sponges and the clams and the brachiopods. And they're living on top of each other and next to each other. All the wonders you can do with sedimentology, you are out of luck when you have these distinct animals that um, are not as closely tied to the sediment as we once would have thought. Uh, so one of the ways we can ask this question is food web, all right? And because I was trained in marine biology before I came to paleontology, my attitude is always, well, start with the animals we know and use that to uh, trigger our imagination. So what do we know about where cephalopods, octopus, squid, things like that, fall in the food web today? Well, all cephalopods that are alive are meat eaters. None of them are vegetarians, right? They're all eating something else, whether they're detritivores or vicious carnivores, they span the gambit, but they're all eating meat. But the problem is within squids, say, where they fall in the food web, it depends. The older you are, the higher proportion of your diet is cannibalism. Most cephalopods include cannibals, and squids especially. They're all over the food web. So if you say, where are you in the food web? It's like, well, what day is it? How big am I? I'm everywhere in the food web. This does not help us a lot, right? And when I was coming up in this work, people say, well, ammonites are probably just eating other ammonites. So I was like, you're not helping, right? But if we look at modern cephalopods, yeah, no, probably they're eating each other, right? Now, another way to look at this is metabolism. All right, so we have this general idea that small things have high metabolism, a little mouse, fast heart rate, fast oxygen consumption, a little, um, how do you say, hummingbird, same deal, right? But a, an elephant, slower heartbeat, slower metabolism, the per body mass consumption of oxygen and resources is lower. So people like to kind of paint this and say, well, it's all about size. It's gonna be all about size. The big ammonites would have been lower metabolic demand. That's just, that's just math. And we can say, okay, well, where do fish fall and where do invertebrates fall? Well, if you're gonna talk about jellies, it's kind of a different story, but you could still craft this story. So, okay, well, generally that fits. What about cephalopods? Which one, right? If you wanna talk about squids, the death-defying speed racers of cannibalistic mayhem at sea, they've got really high metabolic rates. And this is over, by the way, this is an order of magnitude each hop in body size. Squids also grow from itsy bitsy to friggin' huge, right? And so that allows you to say, oh, well, over what span of body size? And they might have ludicrously high metabolisms or vampire squid, I mean. He looks cool, but he's just a detrite of war lurking in the deep. So again, this isn't really helping us in terms of locking down what the metabolic rate or even its relationship to size should have been within ancient cephalopods that are extinct. And also, they were around for a really long time through so many booms and busts. What I take from both of these is that what were they doing in the food web? Probably everything. So that we doesn't really constrain anything for us, right? In any particular case. What were they doing metabolically? Probably everything. It would be silly to assert that this 300 million year um, sort of coliseum of competition through evolution and mass extinction yielded during all that time only one option of metabolic expression. That would be silly. It, it, probably they were doing a lot. So. If we kind of block it out like that, then we are left with how do we approach this problem for ammonites? We can still compare them to modern animals. And one of the things we should think about is that these animals, there are lots of different ways that cephalopods can move, but the modern ones can do jet propulsion. You take in some water and you squirt it out. Now, I would be a rich woman if I had a nickel for every time somebody said, but they're going backwards, how can they see? Right? I have a pet bunny rabbit. And she can't see you, but if she's here, she can see all of you, right? She's got a very uh, spherical sense of her vision. It's very short, <laughs> right? So for many animals, seeing all the way around you, and squids are the same, you know, their eyes are right on the sides of their heads. It's not a problem to see where they're going if they're going what we think of as butt first, because of this binocular vision and looking at a particular thing, you know, that's for us and T-Rex, I guess, right? So. Um, these animals are going backwards, but that's using our very biased lens on the situation. But they can bring water in and jet it out. Now, whereas our squid are fast and agile, 
And our chamber nautilus are, yeah, I mean, they can outswim you for a few minutes. They can get a good clip going, but not all day, right? Ammonites, they came in all these ridiculous shell shapes, right? And that can be a little bit vexing. Now, in squid, it's all soft body, and they have various uh, sort of stiff or rigid components to keep them from going floppity floppity when they're zooming around. But a chamber nautilus has an external shell. A lot of that external shell is made out of air pockets. So it's kind of like early hot air balloon technology. You can separate the problem of buoyancy from the problem of navigation. These are two separate problems. If you have these air pockets in your shell, which sure enough, the coiled ammonites did. Now, I will not in this talk talk a whole lot about the ones with all the wacky coiling. We call them heteromorphs, which just means different forms because they're wacky. A lot of the ammonites, most of them that you pick up in a shop, they've got a nice, pleasant planar spiral form, right? But there's still a huge variety within that of how much of that volume was broken out into air chambers and the distribution of the soft tissue versus the air chambers in any given animal. So I have had the great fortune to work with Nick Hebden and David Peterman both over the last several years, and I will share some work that I've published with them as, long as, as well as some of our up and coming projects. So um, Nick did a PhD here with me from 2015 to, I want to say 2021. Yes, it was all mid-pandemic, but we, he did actually get to wear a robe and graduate and everything. And David Peterman did a PhD at Wright State University and came to work with me uh, during the pandemic uh, on a postdoc that he got from the National Science Foundation. So um, one of the funny things, Peterman did a lot of work on hydrostatics, which is how are these things balancing in the water? If you have seen a reconstruction of one of these straight shelled cephalopods, it is always flying through the water like, and you're like, gonna throw it like a javelin. And we love that so much because it would be so great. If it is the sort of cephalopod that does not have a whole lot of ballast, that is just a regular, all right, chambered shell up there, body here, you cannot screw with the physics very much on that. It is going to be pointing up down because it's got air pockets here and it's got squish here and the squish is heavy and the air pockets are light. So one of the things David did during his dissertation was look at, okay, well, you've got a center of mass and a center of buoyancy. The center of mass is, okay, you've got some volume and you've got some weight distribution within that volume. The center of buoyancy is full stop. You are, you are replacing some water and that water has a center. Right? So these are sort of two different questions. If the center of mass and buoyancy are a bit removed, then you can poke it, but it'll just kind of pendulum swing back. All right? And you could poke it again. And how do we know this? Well, David built a lot of these and then he poked them. It's very fun. So he has specialized in creating these ways to recreate these really intricate models that go all into the detail and the suture lines and all of that. And then 3D printing models that reproduce the most importance of the parts of that physics. Right? He can make prints that are really pretty and have all the little sutures, but he can also make prints that say, okay, I want the same mass and buoyancy distribution in my model, and then put it in a swimming pool and see what it does. Now working with me, it was hilarious, hilarious. <laughs> Remember that old pandemic thing? He arrived in August 2020 and we all said, oh, I mean, you know, I'm sure we'll be allowed back in the building soon. I'm sure we'll be allowed, we could go use the engineering lab. Oh, some higher up doesn't want us to use the engineering lab. All right, well, we used the college swimming pool. Right? So first we started with rain barrels in his garage, then we started with a swimming pool in Dr. Brenda Bowen's backyard, and then we finally made it to the college swimming pool. For the first two years that he was here, it was swimming pools. Now something that's cool about this, this was sort of the bright idea we had when we were in this thicket of nonsense. I had wanted to build a great big water chamber. I got some funding. I got uh, the career award from the National Science Foundation, and he got funding from the National Science Foundation to do a postdoc. So he's like, all right, what are we going to do? So I want to build a big water chamber. We talked all through it, and then we decided, wait a minute. What if we build a mobile rig that we can put in any body of water that we want? So in his garage, Peterman dutifully drew up and then finally built this mobile rig made out of four inch PVC pipe and trailer hitches and um, uh, GoPro cameras. So this is our two camera rig and you can go, you take it apart and put it in a big suitcase. <laughs> you arrive looking like a crazy person and you unfurl it and you put it in the pool. And so it has these cameras, you can position it however you want in the pool. You do your experiments in front of it, and because you have two cameras, you can get um, you can get machine learning, artificial intelligence software to do some motion tracking of those points from the two cameras for you. 
So you can say, hey, I got two cameras here. Yeah, it doesn't work with one camera, it works with two cameras. All right. So it took a lot of we used to go we used to go to Liberty Park during the pandemic and like throw footballs between the cameras because we did all these things before we ever got in a pool. We had to do a lot of like testing and calibrating. Anyway, finally, he has these 3D printed models. And what David did with his first round of models, they're, they're very simple on the inside. They're plastic with some air pockets. And then he also made a bismuth counterweight. Why bismuth? It's very easy to cast in your garage, apparently. So. Um, he made these bismuth counterweights so that these, uh, these models would be able to, once they were in water, be positively buoyant to the tune of the same amount of thrust that a nautilus of this size would release. Or a cuttlefish of this size, or maybe even a little bit negatively buoyant so it would settle down. All right, so we take these things in the water, he lets them go, and what you're seeing here is a slow motion video of that along with its tracking points on the top and bottom that the cameras are able to capture. So we're able to say, how fast did the guy go? All right, now this is his reconstruction of all these guys being straight up and down. People still hate this reconstruction so much because they want to throw them. They want them to be going. But something that we worked out, I didn't put this figure in the talk, but something we worked out for this that I think is the most interesting is like, okay, well, what if you are playing chicken with an ichthyosaur, right? If, if Jim's the ichthyosaur and I'm the ammonite and we're all over here just kind of hanging out and shooting the breeze and then, oh, there's an ichthyosaur over there, there's 40 of us. If I try to go one way or the other, the ichthyosaur can chase me. If I just try to go up about a half meter and I'm about a half meter in length, I just want to go a couple body lengths, just a meter, and just go up, well, he'll just keep chasing me, right? But if I wait until he's right about here, and then I go up, he's gonna have a harder time turning around or he's just gonna eat you, right? It's the old joke when you're tying your shoes. I don't need to outrun the bear, I just need to outrun you. So we have to stop asking, this is where the imagination comes in. We need to stop asking, why wouldn't they be going straight though? Who says they wanna go straight? Up is perfectly serviceable. And how fast do they need to go? Eh, faster than the guy next to him, right? You don't need to be the fastest. It is not survival of the fittest, it is survival of the minimally fit. You need to be the one that does not get eaten on that Tuesday, then you're fine. So this very simple set of experiments, beautifully orchestrated, um, allowed us to look at that. Now here's another one, this is a heteromorph. This one's twisted like an ice cream cone. And this is when he actually, so the first thing he did when he arrived in August, 2020, he made the reconstructions, made the physical models, came to my house, got some rain barrels and put them in the rain barrel in his garage. And if you make it positively buoyant so that it's swimming upward, and it's just a plastic model, there's no motor here, it just wants to get out of the water, and he literally has garbage grabbers down there, right? And it twirls, right? Of course it twirls. And this is the kind of thing that you could sit down and imagine or play with or do on paper, but he actually does the physics so carefully, so right, just nice, right? And then, oh yeah, it twirls, cool. And so what happens if you drop it and it's negatively buoyant? Oh, it also twirls, right? Now, what would be the use of twirling? Well, if you're a detritivore, or you're eating very small other things in the ocean, twirling is great, because all you need is just a tiny bit of go, and you have the whole smorgasbord at your fingertips, right? And this could be done with buoyancy differences, so you don't even need to be propelling yourself through jet propulsion. You can just be a little bit positively buoyant, and then you have your salad bar, right? So. Um, this is all the biomechanics of hydrostatics. Now, what was great is um, David was working on these models where we really care about the interior. What I had been doing for years with Nick Hebden as my PhD student was totally different models where we only care about the exterior. So bringing the two of them together was just magical, all right? And their first paper that they, they both worked on was from, from scratch was this one where he said, oh, hey, Nick, can you do your magic? Where you can say, hey, what if it was in water? Hey, computer, what do you think the water would do? And create an illustration of how water ought to be flowing around this object. So bringing these simulations and the experiments together really allows us to push the questions we're able to ask. So this then is David. David is uh, doing what I think is very wise. He's putting out a lot of his personal reconstructions on the interwebs. So when you Google the thing, you get that instead of it crawling around in the mud because um, it breaks his heart. We like Wherever we go, if we see pictures of an upside down Nautilus or something, the first thing we do is text it to Peterman just to make him cry. Um, <laughs> all right, so this is another set of experiments. This is twirling, all right? This is a Nautilus balanced like a real Nautilus. And these things have no motor in them and they aren't neutrally or positively buoyant. These things are, I'm sorry, they're neutrally buoyant. And that is very difficult. Getting something to sit in the water and not go up or down 
One of the ways we achieved this was by putting a little water pocket in it. After all the physics and everything was printed, put a little water pocket in it and having a self-healing cap on it and a syringe of water so you could add or remove water so you could get the weight just right. Because we would test this and then we'd arrive at the swimming pool and it would be a degree hotter or a degree colder, right? And so there we are at a swimming pool with syringes trying not to look, you know, spooky. It was hilarious. Anyway. In this experiment, we are interested in um, the stability of these animals. So a nautilus, it, it has a preferred orientation. And if it gets smacked out of its orientation, or if it jets in a way that kicks it out of its orientation, it's going to settle promptly back into its orientation that it prefers, right, through physics. But this coiled up shape, remember him? Yeah, he doesn't care a whole lot, right? It's a very slow return. This thing is not stable. Now, people have used this observation to say, well, what this animal would do is if it tried to go anywhere, it would just pinwheel around and go and not actually be able to jet anywhere. It will restore, but slowly. We're going to come back to that. All right, so now if we go into the biomechanics of the external part of the shell, we care less about the interior and more about how water would flow around it. Now, if we think again about this whole wide variety of shell shapes and just their exterior, one way to break these down is to consider a variance between very streamlined and very inflated like a basketball and this coiled up snake shape, which is what the hell. I mean, it's compressed, but it's not streamlined because it's got all this business on the sides. This was something I worked on with Dave Botcher, my PhD advisor at the University of Spoiled Children in Los Angeles. Um, and we published this back in 2020, 2012, <laughs> a little while ago, where we said, OK, taking what um, Vesterman and all of his colleagues over the last 100 years have said we think is going on with these different shapes and the consequences of them, can we mass it out? And then you just measure your shell and you tell me where it goes on the map. And then I tell you if it could swim or not. This is a pipe dream that doesn't hold up over decades but it's a neat idea, so we're gonna keep it in mind, all right? So we basically have frisbee shaped, uh, sports ball shaped, and coiled up snake shaped, right? And a nautilus is kinda in between. They're a little more streamlined than a sphere, eh, not by a whole lot, right? And so with Nick, one of the things that we pioneered over the last uh, decade, really, was how to get 3D models that we wanna play with. We can make them from scratch in a computer, or we can make these uh, replicas of real specimens. Now, if you've worked in museum collections and you've opened the drawers, you've said, ooh, look, a replica of the type specimen. And it's made out of plaster. Somebody made a rubber mold. Somebody poured plaster in the mold. Somebody wrapped it in bubble wrap. Somebody mailed that plaster mold to the institution. And you drop it on the floor, and your name is mud. Because somebody has to go and make another one. And they might not have permission to make another one. They might not have the original on hand. Very annoying. Well, if we can use a 3D surface scanner to make very nice reconstructions of specimens, then we can play with them, right? We can have 3D specimens in our simulations that are replicas of the real thing or are messed up replicas of the real thing. What if it's squishier? What if it's wider? We can mess with it, right? That's fun. And also then for museums and all of the collections concerns, not only putting these things online, but also having the physical specimen printed out, it's glorious. So here is video that I took on my phone of the computer that runs this software. So this is, at the University of Utah, we have this thing called the Protospace. Come check it out. During the pandemic, they took an entire floor of book stacks and put those downstairs. And they put in augmented reality, virtual reality, gaming stations, Lego tables, 3D printers, 3D scanners all out on the floor so you can just show up and log in with your credentials and start. The number of young ladies doing lightsaber whatever it is with the goggles on is just a fabulous experience every time I'm there. Um, it's just it's a smorgasbord of weird. So this scanner is uh, using reflected light to figure out the structure of this specimen. This is at the uh, American Museum in New York. And then on the laptop computer, I'm running the software that makes the 3D model. And here is, I'm, I have it on a little, a little twirler, a little spill plate, and it has this little, does this stuff. This is, oh, a dozen different takes that the computer then will put back together for me. Ah, thank you, computer. That is then a 3D model that it just built in real time right before my eyes. And you make a half dozen of those, and then you sew them all together, and then you're on your way. So in two and a half days of museum time, we were able to make 30 really high quality submillimeter scale resolution models of things about the size of a softball. And then another dozen uh, 
paper Nautilus just for giggles. All right, so again, doing this then, the software can generate an actual picture of the fossil. It can generate kind of a mesh of uh, three-dimensional points. One of the things I love about this is that this model that comes out the other end, this is the same file size as a picture that your dad sent you that he took on his phone, right? You can have a file size that's in the megs, you know, but it's not gigabytes. If you work with CT scans, not only are they very pricey, I got frustrated with this instrument this week and I asked a buddy, oh, what if I just want to CT scan these little ones? They said, yeah, no, that's great. You can do it. It's only $300 a pop. I was like, oh, this is $300 a pop. I'll take this, right? Not that it's free. It's an expensive scanner, but it's already owned by the university and they let me borrow it. Haha. <laughs> so this thing, this specimen, this 3D model, it isn't this gigantic thing for which you need all the software in the world and all the devices in the world to store it. This end of the day model that it spits out is just the same size as a photograph. So if you're a museum and you're saying, gee whiz, we gotta, autom we gotta automate some game plan and we gotta digitize our collections. We can't do 3D models, get out of town. Nobody has the storage space for that. You can, it's like that. And it's, it's very nice. Um, so, ha <laughs> I just love watching it happen. All right, but what can we do with these models in science? Well, we can imagine, use the computer to simulate, how water would flow around the specimen if it was in a, tra a, a space where water was moving around it. The way this is done is the computer, and Nick figured all this out from scratch during his PhD, which was amazing, because I, I knew somebody could do it, but I can't do it. I, I was trying to do things in tanks. He said, can I please computer, though? And I said, kid, if you want to just sip caffeine for the next five years and never leave your hole, you, be my guest. And he said, sounds great. He's great in the field, but he would just like to be plugged into the internet and have a caffeine drip intravenously. So, you can make a big imaginary fish tank and break it into little pieces. And then the math is done in each piece. Oh, I get some water from there. Cool. How fast is it going? What's the pressure? Now you take it at some other pressure. And you can take a thing about the size of a fish tank and break it into 10 million little math problems and then ask the computer to just do the math problems for you. So this mesh represents an ammonite shaped hole in that fish tank and all the little broken down cells of water around it, the little volumes that we let the computer math out for us. Now there's a lot more behind it than that, including telling it what the properties of the water are. And you'll notice it's got this thing here. This is a boundary layer. Depending on how fast that water is going, there's gonna be more or less boundary layer where the physics are changed close to the specimen. Anyway, blah, 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 Nick's PhD later, we were able to say, okay, what results are we going getting and can we ground truth them? So if we say simulation this is the, sorry, the text is messed up. This is velocity and this is drag, okay? So you've got a sphere. You've got some different 3D simulation, some models of ammonites we made, right? Just in a computer model. And then we've got an actual scan of a chambered nautilus and we did a little nautilus and a big nautilus because size matters as we'll see. If it's bigger, it has more drag. Que suppressa, right? Now, here are the actual experimental results that are published that we can compare to, okay? So, for our little ammonites, in black are our simulations, which are, you know, perfect, because it's a computer, right? But in open circles, that's the experimental results from the 90s, from Dave Jacobs. And a paper came out in, um, oh gosh, 2018, where they did particle image velocimetry, where you basically put glitter in the water and use lasers to measure how fast it goes, to put a nautilus in a cube of water, and they waggled a shrimp at it, and it went, I want, I want, wait, come back. And they were able to say all kinds of things about the jets and the velocities and so forth. So I was able to back calculate from their metadata what the drag in those experiments were on their medium-sized nautilus, and it was these green dots, right? So, oh, and then the sphere, oy vey, the research on spheres, our sphere is this purple one, and then experimental and analytical results are in red and blue. So, we're in the ballpark, right? Order of magnitude, velocity, and drag, we have reasonable results benchmarked to actual experiments in physics, right? From across the spectrum of living animals, imaginary physics, and real experiments from flume tanks. Now, if we take this and say, okay, well, I got you, I got you, I'm following you. We got the inflaty one and the compressy one, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Can we work out and ask this question now? Yes, we can. We can take the wide variety of ammonites that exist between these shapes. We can pick out some specific specimens. And this is where I hired Olivia Jenkins, a video game designer from the University of Utah, to create a shell generator for us. And we were able to make a variety of shells 
do the math on them and for context on this graph. So from 1 to 50 centimeters per second, 5, everybody be a sloth, be a sloth, be a sloth. That's 5 centimeters per second, right? Half a meter per second is busy Manhattan sidewalk out of my way, out of my way, right? So on that spectrum of going kind of medium to fat, and these guys are all five centimeters in, in diameter in this example. So they would be, this would be just going one body length per second. Like, oh, this is fine. This is great. Look at me. So this is the, the rate at which cherry blossoms fall. Yeah. Uh, so now in terms of what I'm measuring here with the drag force, dyne is a little uncanny. So what is that? A little bit of dyne is about a paperclip of pressure, right? A force, right? Uh, 100 dyne is about if you had one of those little apples, like a lunchbox apple, and you're holding it. That's about how much force we're talking about. And 1,000 dyne is about a little bottle of water. All right? Now, we did these experiments, and guess what? We've got a whole bunch of different shapes, and if they go faster, they generate more drag. Cool. OK, well, that's not very helpful, because we knew that already. What if we break this down, and we look more closely? We can say, OK, well, the velocity, sure enough, the more streamlined things have less drag than a comparably sized thing that is more inflated. Okay, we're getting somewhere. But uh, what's also nice about this is the experiments, they couldn't really get under maybe 10 centimeters per second because the experiments are just annoying and difficult. And the forces are really itsy bitsy. That's hard to measure. We tried to, I was going to order a force transducer that could measure this spectrum of forces physically. And Nick finally stopped me. He said, well, it costs two, $2,000, which we have. But if you walked it from our building to the engineering building, you would break it because it is so sensitive. You can't like handle it. I'm like, All right. So we've got this spectrum of values that we can simulate. And we know from proof of concept that they match up to experiments. And we can ask questions like, why is this happening? Sometimes it's because of differential pressure on the shell. That's one way to look at it. And other ways you can look at it is how fast the water is moving around the shell. Now, we need to think about what even is streamlining, though? Right, because you could say, OK, well, this thing is more streamlined, so it has less drag. OK, that makes sense. And uh, I don't know, physics. What is streamlining? The Reynolds number relates your size and velocity to the behavior of the water around you. The water is either going to have experience laminar flow, where chunks of water would prefer to stay together and move around you, or turbulent flow, where chunks of water say, screw it, you're on your own, I'm going this way and you end up with turbulent eddies. Now, most physics that you do on land, we're always in turbulent, right? And cells are in laminar. So everybody tells me, don't worry about Judge Reynolds number, because you're always in turbulent. It doesn't matter. But it turns out that ammonites experience transitional flow, all right? Now, the coefficient of drag relates your expected drag with what you actually get. And the coefficient is just the whoopsie doody. I don't know. Something about your shape made it different -y. Right? That's what a coefficient of drag is. It's, I don't know, it's a fudge factor for uh, shape something. Right? Now, if we have, this is the data from one of our simulations. All right? We can say the coefficient of drag decreases with higher Reynolds number. What this means is as you are going faster or larger, the way that shape contributes to your drag is not so much. Your shape is allowing a discount your drag is less than you expected. You get a little discount. It's like a senior discount on Tuesdays at Savers, right? It's like you are going faster, you are larger, guess what? Your shape is allowing you to have a little less drag than we expected. Cool, right? Now, this is because of two features. It is because of viscous drag, which falls away rapidly. And that is when you're pushing through the water or ammoniting through the water, right? The water that is cohesive around you in laminar flow is causing friction and drag. It's viscous and it's dragging across you and that's annoying. But once you're going fast enough and you break out of that laminar condition into a turbulent condition, it becomes just totally stupid. There's like nothing to it, right? And this is on a log scale, right? So you go from a really big problem to not a problem. Meanwhile, pressure drag, which is I'm pushing through the water and this is where suddenly my shape tells you about what my cross-sectional area is. 
Because once I have a certain cross-sectional area and I let go of all that viscous drag, I still have that cross-sectional area to contend with. It's a, I'm going to get bigger, but it, it doesn't really go away. right? So pressure drag evens out. Viscous drag goes away wildly. Together, they make this discount. Each different shape has a different flavor of how this happens. And that's what streamlining is. And more importantly, our ammonites that I was showing you on those different spectrum of size, uh, they were all the same size going various speeds, and they had various forces. A single ammonite that's about the size of a golf ball or a tennis ball, it is going to experience this entire gambit from laminar to turbulent flow in a single voyage from sitting still to going somewhere. Or an individual ammonite, as it goes from the size of a P to the size of a Fiat, is going to experience those conditions as it grows. So the turbulent turn on, the transitional flow, totally unavoidable to these animals. Now, um, the crossing point is interesting to us because that's when you see that. So now if we think about, OK, we've got, instead of putting our things and just saying, oh, the faster you go, the more drag you have. We know. We get it. But if you say the more inflated things, look, they get less of a discount. And the more streamlined, compressed things, look, they get more of a discount. Cool. OK. And this is where it gets really weird. We can fill in all the intermediate shapes. Now, remember our coiled up snake guys? Here's what's weird. When they are small or slow or both, they have about the same result as a really streamlined guy. Once they are big or fast, that's when that hubcap starts to cost you in a little bit of drag by you having less of a discount. You don't get as big as you don't get a senior discount, you get a veteran's discount on Tuesdays, right? So these guys have a different discount only when they are large enough or fast enough for turbulence to even matter. So this is where imagination comes in. For decades, people have been saying, well, these would be terrible at swimming because there would be all this turbulence. Only if you're in a turbulent regime, my friend. If you're still in a transitional regime, it's not a big deal, all right? So working with Yunji Choi, who is a sewage engineer I met at a jujitsu class. I love Small Lake City. She's now a huge co-author with us, and she was instrumental in helping Nick finish his dissertation. She has a PhD in all of these physics and engineering, and she, she works for a company. She has a day job. She thinks it's fun to come play with us, so she comes to conferences with us and publishes with us. She's amazing. Um, she helped us ask the question, OK, what are the practical consequences? You've got, imagine you have an ammonite, and it's now it's dynamic. It's over time. What if you have some thrust? Well, it's going to generate some drag, right? And then that's going to have some acceleration. And that's going to have some velocity. And that's going to have distance traveled. You got somewhere. Congratulations. So this little laminite in our example, after a minute, oh, wait, how far did you get? Oh, two and a half meters. Cool. That's a kind of big one. OK. And then we can compare that to what if you did three jets? Ah, now we're getting somewhere because you can go thrust, thrust, thrust. Oh, my drag is building up because I've got all this thrust, right? And you say, hey, how far did you get in a minute? Oh, three and a half meters, not bad. And then you can say, what if you were smaller? We can suddenly play all the games, right? What if you're small? What if you're big? What if you have one jet? What if you have lots of jets? And we can suddenly do the physics to ask the math. We can do the math to ask these really dynamic questions, even though our simulations are just, let's say you're in a box and it's going five centimeters per second. OK, we'll wait a day. Oh, well, look, we got an answer. Then we can suddenly, when we have enough of those values, to figure out what those curves are like from these, wait for it, this. Having enough data to do this allows us to do this. So it's about math and imagination. And then we can ask questions like, OK, so I'll give you a minute. How far did you get? OK, if you're little, everybody got not very far. If you're medium, everybody got oh, somewhere. And if you're big, they got somewhere. This is with one jet. Now again, survive a little minimally fit. When you're little, it doesn't really make much of a difference, does it, what shape you are. When you're medium, it's starting to matter. You don't have to be the front of the pack. But you don't want to be the back of the pack. When you're big, it really matters. What if you do three jets? Well, if you're little, hot damn. That actually makes a difference. Not between individuals, but between one and three jets. Suddenly, just saying, oh, let's get out of here, squirt. Or let's get out of here, squirt, 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 makes a huge difference, right? And if you're medium, look, you can catch up to those big boys, no problem. And you spread out a lot more. The big guys, you start to get diminishing returns. After a while, it's like, eh, one jet, multiple jets, I don't know, drag's going to catch up with me. I'm just, I'm going to get there when I get there. The dynamism we get to play with is incredible, which brings us robots. All right, so I'm going to wrap up by, remember that rig that we built? Here we are in the Bowen and Bowen pool, <laughs> trademark. I am noticed wearing a lot of clothing. This is like September. We had to pull Peterman out because he kept turning blue. I'm like, no, I've got a wetsuit. I get very cold very easily. Anyway, we have here a robot that Peterman built that is not only all the fancy physics of being so balanced, 
It also has an onboard impeller motor that squirts water on command to the tune of as hard as he wants it to squirt, to the tune of how many squirts he wants, and he programmed it all with a remote control that has um, uh, infrared Bleep, 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 like you turn your TV on and off or volume up or down. Yeah, so we got a TV remote control and you program the buttons. So literally, I'm there and I'm saying, was it nine for 100%? Okay, and I, I push zero, makes it squirt once. So we're remote controlling this thing. In the, oh, also, we have to get it neutrally buoyant, like you do. So here we are. Uh, there it is. Ah, it's going. Isn't it beautiful? This is so ridiculous. This was our whole, what was this last summer? I mean, this was like all we did was robots. And it's hilarious. He built four different working robots, each with their own shape, each with their own dynamic. And this is the interior of what's in that robot. He has the counterweight. Now, all of these have greater stability than they should because the stability projects right now are separate until we put them together. If it was up to Peterman, he would just have the perfect robot 10 years from now and put it in the water one time and get all of his results. But we were able to replicate this. We did 15 or 20 or 30 runs per dude, right? And then he, he did all the AI and the computers to make it figure out what it's doing. So this is a little, this is what they look like. They have these, we're taking them apart with like hot wax and then it was getting, we're, we're at the swimming pool with like a hair dryer to melt the wax to put the models together. It was ridiculous. So anyway, robots, like you do. Okay, it's thinking about getting to the next slide. It might be a little, it's sweating because the files are large. I broke the computer when I presented this in, uh, let's see, is it this one? Yeah, here we go. Okay, so we can say, of these two guys that are kind of streamlined, one has that hubcap showing and one is uh, streamlined and does not have the hubcap showing, right? Oh my gosh, look at that the velocity, and then it decreases, okay? And then, oh, look, three peaks. You can do faster and faster, but you don't get a whole lot faster because you kind of come down. Eventually, drag catches up with you, just like we said it would in the math. Look at this guy. No problemo, my friend. You go faster and faster and faster. This guy kept getting away from us. He would go off camera. He'd be like, damn it, we need to do it again. Like, he'd go so fast. And this is a lot of the imagination part. I would just tell David, we just need to play. We just need to be in the water playing with these things so we can even imagine what it is they might do before we design the experiment with the parameters to measure what they're going to do because these things are getting away from us. The ones that were more spherical, we could not do the three jet experiment because they would just start going everywhere. <laughs> By the second jet, they'd be like, no, I'm on this side of the pool. We'd be like, damn it, they're off camera again. Obviously, we can get more cameras. Obviously, we can engineer these differently. But the premise is, hey, remember that math I showed you where your drag is going to come back to haunt you if you're going fast enough and if you're big enough, it does or it doesn't, all right? So this then was something we did at the last minute. He said, oh, if I put a different nozzle on it, we can make it twirl in a circle, right? So we put the cameras on top and we have it twirling in a circle. Now this is that spherical guy. Look how nicely he twirls in a circle. You let him go one jet and he just twirls in a circle. I mean, yeah, duh, because it's a sphere, right? Do you think our real streamlined guy did real good at this? No, make him go sideways. He's like, ah, crap, this is terrible. It's awful. So, hmm, do we sense a trade-off in maneuverability and speed? Ah, perhaps we do. So if we go back to this question, what's going on with the early Jurassic? We got all these ammonites, and they're shaped like coiled up snakes. Well, I mean, it's probably not for maneuverability, it's probably not for speed, but it could definitely be for cruise efficiency, especially at those sizes. It's about survival of the minimally fit. If everybody's doing it, you don't need to be wildly fast. What you need to say is, hey, Patrick, I heard there's some shrimp on the other side of the island. Let's make our way over there, but casual-like, so we don't get dead, right? If you starve to death on the way to the food, it doesn't matter. Now, you might be asking, yeah, those guys aren't so smooth, though. After a little while, by the time we leave the Hetangian, get into the Cinemarian, boy, howdy, do these guys have ribs on them. So glad you asked. We are going to be looking at size changes and ribs. So Makila, my new PhD student, who's incredible, first generation college students are amazing. Nick was one, Makila is one. She has made this army of ammonites, which are these models she made from scratch that go from baby to adult in the way that their shapes actually change along individual ontogeny trajectories. And she is starting to do the math of, okay, well, we've got some velocity, we got some force. Okay, going faster means higher force, cool. Being bigger means higher force, cool. But we're starting to get those trade-offs. If the sub-adult gets a discount that tapers off after a while, and then the adult morph 
doesn't get that much discount, but it gets a deeper discount on a later day of the week, right? If when you're in this higher Reynolds number regime, it would behoove you for your physics, your drag would be reduced if you are wearing the adult outfit. Well, look, that's what they're doing. We can test which of these ontogenetic trajectories yield uh, you know, increased benefits in hydrodynamic efficiency or speed or maneuverability versus which eh, don't. And that doesn't mean that those features don't matter or that selection isn't acting. It just means that's not the thing for which selection is focused in this animal. Uh, my shape decreases pressure drag. So this is looking at two individuals. So we've got a subadult in light pink and the adult in purple. The subadult reduces its viscous drag. The adult moves that out to a higher Reynolds regime. So it ends up with, if you're at a higher Reynolds regime and you're in the adult shape, you have less pressure drag for your size and speed and everything else, and that's nice. But if you're not that big, if you're not at that Reynolds number regime, it doesn't matter if you have a higher one because you've reduced your viscous drag. Uh, and finally, I mentioned that we're going to do something about ribs. Not only are we just really enjoying going all over the world and looking at museums and getting these incredible models of all these different ways the ribs are shaped because it makes my heart beat, um, this is our Nautilus and our Serpenticone side by side. This animal would be able to have the maneuverability. Remember how I said it was a concern that they might pinwheel? Relax. He has hydrostatic instability. He has hydrodynamic stability. He could say, Jet that way, choo, choo, choo. ooh, I like it. Now jet that way, pew! They need to be going diagonal. Why do we always have them going sideways, right? Isn't that stupid? Didn't I start the talk with that stupid? We have something, well, suppose you're just going this way. In whatever it would be your hydrostatic orientation, just suppose you're going straight. That would be stupid. Why would they be doing that? The, well, these could change their hydrostatic orientation to be positioned to go in whichever direction they so please, and then to go there, and we also need to be thinking about how drag is affected by their position relative to gravity. What if it had ribs, though? I'm so glad you asked. Watch what the ribs do. It still moves slowly, but it re equilibrates faster. There's a lot of math, blah, 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 but the ribs are important. So this just got accepted last week. It is in integra integrated organismal biology, I think, as this is David and I. This just got accepted last week. It's very exciting. This is where we're going next. Um, I want to end by letting you know that Sarah Crump is an assistant professor who joined us at the University of Utah in the Department of Geology and Geophysics. She studies ancient DNA, and she did a ton of graduate work at uh, Colorado Boulder uh, in Greenland and worked with the people in Greenland and has just had this incredible career, and um, we are losing her to cancer, just like that. So anybody watching at home or here, if you want, um, we just found out that the University of Colorado Boulder is putting together a graduate research fellowship that will fund um, uh, women and people from all kinds of communities to participate and go to grad school and do research in the Arctic. Um, and so we have our newest paleontologist in our community is now leaving our community. So that's hard, but um, she is an incredible person and she is here in Salt Lake. She bought a house with her partner and her family is here and her friends are here. And um, there's a caring bridge for her. So if you're acquainted with her, I can let you have that. Um, but if you want to support women in Arctic science, uh, it's one way to honor Sarah. So thank you. <laughs>